Happy holidays. Okay, so the review of the items that I don't have time to review. That doesn't make any sense. Let me explain. Um, so I like to do a lot of like high production stuff. I like to do a lot of B-roll. I like to uh, kind of loosely script my videos to make sure I'm not missing anything and that I can kind of bullet point all the features and everything like that. Uh, and all that stuff and the editing for all of that all takes a lot of time. So this video is gonna have no B-roll, not gonna be really edited outside of maybe a couple cuts here and there. Um, and I have three items that I wanna talk about. Well, actually four, but I have three basic items that I wanna talk about. And we're gonna go ahead and start off with this LS50, but I wanna make a couple of disclaimers here, or disclo not disclosures, that's the wrong one. See, this is why I normally edit. Uh, I wanna make a, a couple of apologies here. Well, just one. Jeez, it's rough here. Okay, so um, this is owned by a guy named Adam. Adam is a friend of mine. Adam, I appreciate you sending this out. Um, I had a, the fullest of intentions to fully review this thing, but this is a very complicated device and just projects are packing and packing and packing on. And I just, unfortunately, don't have time to do a dedicated review of it. So I'm gonna do my best here and hopefully we can slap this together and make something that is uh, relatively uh, good and fulfilled. Um, I also have this Aris R2R DAC that I want to talk about. Uh, the Hyphman TWS in your wireless headphones and the Focal Stelia. All things that I do not intend on reviewing um, in like a, a full dedicated review. So I figured I'd put it all in one place, save a lot of time and uh, get you guys the information and talk about stuff that I do have uh, quite a bit of experience with on these particular items. Okay, so let's start off with the LS50. Um, <clears throat> There's uh, <laughs> there's so many ways to approach the LS50. Uh, the LS50 is a it's a complicated device, right? It's got DSP adjustments, it's got a DAC and amp built in, and it's an LS50. Like it's an LS50 box with all that built into it, basically. Um, so there's when I say there's a couple ways to kind of approach the review. I mean, like how how do you analyze that, especially from a value perspective? That's a big thing on my channel, saying okay. What are you getting for the money? And um, with this, it's like, if you're talking about a $2,000, which is what this comes in, if you're talking about a $2,000 speaker, um, honestly, I don't really think it competes directly with other $2,000 speakers. For example, the Bucard S400s, I prefer over these, The and they're actually back there. The <clears throat> Um, SVS Ultra Towers are way better than these, like night and day. Of course, with those, you have to account for amplification separately. You have to account for um, a DAC um, also into your price consideration. So this is kind of marketed as a high fidelity system. It's, it's marketed as an entire um, kind of hi-fi box, essentially. Like you don't have to buy anything besides this and whatever source you have. And that can even be something like a phone and playing Bluetooth or something like that. So uh, it's kind of it's kind of difficult because um, honestly, if you have an amazing pair of speakers that are really efficient, you don't need a ton of amplification, you can actually get by with a really cheap amplifier and you're gonna end up with a better result than this. For example, those SVS Ultra Towers. Those are surprisingly efficient for how big they are. And I could spend $100 or 120 or 140 whatever it is, on the um, AD18. And uh, even though that's not a particularly good amp DAC, I still think the speakers are so incredible that they would outperform this. But it's not going to have that kind of audiophile purity appeal that the wireless LS50 has. And I've seen a number of other claims, although it's impossible for me to verify for myself, that this is like the best version of the LS50 that you can get up to like $10,000 when it comes to the actual amplification behind it. And a lot of people are claiming that's due to the DSP adjustments and then the custom DSP that this amplifier can run into the actual speakers to basically benefit the speakers the most. And um, I would say that the problem with this argument for me is that you can run DSP for free on just about everything, um, especially if you're running out of a computer source, which I run a computer in my front room. Like instead of having like a DVR or something like that, I just have a computer and then it runs into my DAC. My DAC runs in my amplifier, standard, you know, amplifier setup or standard speaker setup. And then that runs into a stereo system. Um, so I can run DSP for free and uh, I can DSP things to not only be um, better towards my preferences, but also better towards my room. 
and there's you know if you want to spend an extra 120 bucks you can get a whole microphone um, setup that will plug into your computer and will basically adjust the dsp via measurement into your room and that's not something this offers and what's weird about this is that this is also coming in at a price where you know it's it's odd for what this offers so even though a lot of people are saying the technology in this thing is pretty advanced and that's part of the justification for the price, um, I would argue that it's actually not that advanced. Um, something like a Genelec, which you can buy Genelecs for this price, which are a, a pair of studio monitors, are very, very nice. They have a whole line of them. Uh, those are extraordinarily advanced and they also have DSP adjustments. They also have a number of inputs, not quite the same inputs as these, but they're built for different purposes. This is more of a hi-fi system. So this is advanced as a speaker system for a hi-fi system, but when it comes to actual like actual technology, I don't really consider the speaker to be all that advanced. Take uh, these speakers right here that are right off to the side over, over to the desk, uh, the Vanity Transparent One Encores, 600 bucks a pair, and just about as versatile as this. This does one thing, I think, that the uh, Vanity's don't, which is uh, the capability of being a streaming device because you can actually stream via Wi-Fi to this box and it can basically act as a streamer. Um, but outside of that, they're really not that much more advanced. Um, even the Vantage 2 Transparent Zeros, which are like kind of the smaller size, still use like the RJ45 or whatever. Uh, it's either Cat6 or RJ45 on the back of uh, this LS50 wireless. Uh, people were talking about how unique that is, but even the Vantage Transparent Zeros offer that uh, to send the the the, um, the master unit's power and signal over to the slave unit. Um, in a, what's determined to be from people who know more about this than I do, um, a better way than sending you know a, a power speaker cable from the master unit to the slave unit. Um, now it is fair to say okay but you want all the features in one place and i'm like okay that is that is a legitimately fair argument and maybe to some it is worth it um but there's other gaps in the ability of the ls50 that i find weird when it comes to that technology um one the app is really really rough uh it took me about two solid hours to get the app and the computer or, i'm sorry and the uh, ls50 wireless working um, and that's being generous. I think it was more like two and a half. Um, but it, it really did not want to link to my Wi-Fi for some reason. I had to restart my router. I had to restart my computer. I had to restart the LS50. And then there's other technical errors that I've run into with the, this particular LS50 for me, where um, when I plug this in via USB into my computer, um, it stops allowing the computer to play any file or any web page. So I can access the computer, I can access the files, but I can't play YouTube, I can't play Google Play Music, I can't play my FUBAR music, I can't play my archive of music. And so, sorry about that. Uh, so the, and that's just kind of a weird cork and it's probably more specific to either this particular LS50 or my particular computer, that is possible. Um, but it's kind of weird features like that that I've seen pop up where it's not a fully fledged out, clean, super smooth operating system all of the time. Um, and a perfect example of this, is like a huge oversight, is it has automatic off, right? It, like a lot of automatic uh, uh, speakers have a, when they receive no signal for a certain period of time, they'll shut off. I'm not sure what the time period is on this. Maybe it's like 15 or 30 minutes, somewhere around that. But it doesn't have an automatic on. Um, so you have to go and either access the remote every time or go to the top and press the on button and wait for it to boot up. And it doesn't automatically take over when it receives a signal. And this is something that very cheap powered speakers have been able to do. And this can't. And it's kind of a weird, like not necessarily oversight. And perhaps I am blowing it out of proportion a little bit. but. It just kind of seems like there were certain things that just weren't quite thought through all the way. And uh, I see a lot of them. And this is just a few examples, but there have been some other issues. But let's go ahead and talk about the sound. And that was one of the other uh, kind of, 
not necessarily issues that I had, but one of the other battles and grapples that I was having with uh, talking about the speaker where the sound is, it's hard to talk about because you have the DSP adjustments. And with those DSP adjustments in the app, you're talking about, you know, they might as well be infinite variables in sound because you can really adjust the sound to be either how you want it or any particular way you want. So you can make this a super bright speaker or a super dark speaker just based off of your preferences. Um, so that's one of the things I was grappling with. And I kind of determined when I was planning the review for this, I kind of determined that I would just talk about it out of the box with no restrictions on it, where it was just set in kind of like the, the flat profile, no DSP adjustments. And I think that's the fairest way to talk about it because, um, you know, it basically make it as if it was just a standard passive speaker that couldn't have any adjustments. And what, one thing I will say is that this driver, as small as it is, because it's actually a really small driver, I think this is at five and a quarter or something like that. Um, but it's actually even less than that because this coaxial part is not moving. This like a uh, little waveguide here doesn't move, only this ring moves. And uh, so you get a five and a quarter, but it's actually like a five and a quarter donut. So it's even less surface area than a standard five and a quarter. And on the LS, I'm sorry, on the uh, KEF Q150, same size driver, uh, that puts out, a, the Q150 puts out a lot less bass than this driver does. And this is a much more solid box, like it is extremely solid. But I'm quite surprised and impressed about how much sound that this driver can put out despite its small size. Uh, now, it, it is a lot and it does um, stand up pretty well to volume and it must just be the, the DSP adjustment. Maybe it's my room also. But I did notice that the bass, while large in amount, it doesn't quite hold up for quality over equally priced speakers like those S400s. Uh, those S400s in the stock configuration definitely have more bass because uh, they've got like a giant passive radiator on the back and a six inch woofer on the front. And it's an overall slightly warmer speaker and it, it's just got more bass. But when you're talking about the quality of the bass response, it's quite good compared to what overall seems like a impressive amount of bass, but an overall muddy experience. It doesn't really have a lot of quality behind it. Um, there's not a lot of texturization and uh, kind of that really detailed feathery nature that you can get re with really deep notes. And it also starts to shit the bed a little bit when you get into really complex, heavy, extremely dynamic music, like something from a, um, a Hans Zimmer, uh, like on the Interstellar soundtrack where you have this entire orchestra or an entire organ playing and just blasting from high notes to low notes. The bass response does not stack up on this quite like it does on some other equally priced speakers, especially when you compare those SVS Ultra Towers. So the bass response, while half impressive, I wish they would have chosen to go with a little bit less and not quite have the quality issues of the bass response because I really don't like the bass on here. I don't think it stacks up to what I know is, is possible. Um, and you could get, I mean, if we're opening up to other systems, uh, like I think most people should consider, um, because when you're, you're buying it, I think if you're buying this for one particular reason, and that reason being that you have an all-in-one system that you don't have to have to work, you know, you don't have to worry about finding parts, you don't have to worry about pairing, you don't have to worry about, um, you know, getting this piece and that piece. If you just want an all-in system for convenience sake, and you can afford the $2,000 price tag, then yeah, I guess in that circumstance it's recommended. But I think for the rest of us as a reviewer, I kind of had to be like, okay, this serves one particular purpose, but everything else about it just doesn't quite stack up with um, kind of any sort of value. And so when you're talking about other systems, you know, even a pair of like ELAC UB5s with a subwoofer, you're gonna get better sound than this. Um, simple as that. Like a decent subwoofer, spend, uh, you know, three or 400 bucks on the UB5s, spend three or 400 bucks on the subwoofer, you're coming in at less than half the cost, you can still buy a really great DAC amp, and you're gonna be absolutely kicking some ass with that system. And this system would not sound all that great. So um, when it comes to the mid-range, the mid-range is quite nice. Um, I've always liked Kef's mid-range. 
Um, I, I think it, it's got this great level of both a clean sound where it doesn't sound like too far swayed out of uh, you know the apparent neutrality of something but it also does have some sense of warmth to it so it's an inviting sound it's an engaging sound um, but it also doesn't feel unnaturally warm and comparing to the Buchard S300 Mark IIs I think that's a very warm speaker and I think I prefer the mid-range on this over the S300s um, because that's a very warm speaker, but it kind of takes you out of the realism sense. It provides a very enjoyable experience and the bass absolutely stomps. But uh, just for mid-range sake specifically, I think I like the mid-range more on this. It's just got um, not necessarily better placement, although it is more forward than those S300s because S300s are pretty, pretty far back. Um, but I like the, the quality and, uh, and presence of the mid range while also providing a slight bit of warmth, um, just a slight bit of enjoyability that I tend to lean towards a little bit. Now, when it comes to the trouble response is another thing that is, um, unfortunately not really the best in class at all. Um, in fact, when you're comparing the trouble response to the Kef Q150, uh, which is like $300 or $400 a pair. They're almost on par with each other. Almost. Not quite. This obviously edges it out. But they're surprisingly similar in terms of quality of that information. And uh, when it comes to the bass response in the mid-range, I think this you know, kind of crushes that speaker. Uh, but when it comes to the treble response, this doesn't really stand out as being a particularly fantastic treble speaker um, to me either. And it's kind of got a little bit of what Kef seems to be going for now, which is a little bit rolled off trouble response. They don't have the most forward trouble out there. Um, it, it does sound detailed as a speaker. It does sound um, complete in the range, but compared to some other speakers out there, it's really one of those situations where comparison is kind of the death of the speaker for me. Um, and that's the same thing with imaging and soundstage. It's good. I don't think it's $2,000 good, but it is good. Um, but understandably, you are paying for more than just the speaker part of this, more than just the sound part. You're, you're, well, partially, you know what I mean. But you're also paying for the amplification and the DSP and the app, you know, whether you want to or not. Uh, you are paying for all of that when you buy the speaker. And I don't know, this one just, it, it didn't quite hit me the right way. Uh, I didn't love the user experience of this. I didn't really love the sound of this for the money. Um, and admittedly, it is not my preferred sound signature as it is. I do prefer other types of sound signatures personally. So that is one factor that's kind of playing into this. Um, but as far as the review goes, it's, you know, it's, it's like a six out of 10 product. It's right, right. It's, it's good in a lot of ways, incredible build quality. I think it's beautiful. I think the copper on white. In videos and, and, um, and pictures, it looks kind of corny, uh, but in person, it actually looks quite premium. And you can't really tell this in pictures and videos either, but like this side is glossy. Like this outside cover is like a glossy, kind of like think of like piano gloss, but for white. And then the front here, this round face here is like, a textured it almost feels like a it's not but it feels like a ceramic almost like a like a you'd feel it on like a the type of texture that would be on like a clay pot it's kind of got that slightly texturized finish and then again with the piano gloss right here and then you have the copper driver and um i've seen a couple different editions i think the nocturne edition of this is probably like the the, the coolest that's the one i would go for if i were to spring the money for this and it, it's an overall cool device like i'm definitely glad that i checked it out it's a very interesting device. Um, but when you sit down and you live with it for a while, you just start to realize like, okay, like it could be better here and it could be better here. And I think the one saving grace that could have been, but wasn't with this speaker is something that it did better than other things. And I, I guess if you had to say like, you know, there aren't many hi-fi systems that are in like, you know, complete boxes outside of, of, I mean, you could argue that um, 
that studio monitors could be considered a hi-fi system, especially if the type of uh, audio file you are, somebody who is searching for the rig production of the original uh, recording. Um, whereas this is going for not, you know, it's, it's going for a less analytical approach and trying to, uh, it doesn't, you know, no speaker truly achieves it, but it's going more for that, uh, you know, the music is in the room type of feeling rather than you're actually listening to what the recording uh, artist was listening to or the producer was listening to. So I think that's going to wrap it up for the LS50. Um, it's a, like I said, it's a cool device. I don't think it's perfect. Um, in fact, it's got a lot of flaws. Uh, I don't necessarily not recommend it, um, but there are other things that I would definitely recommend before this. And you basically just have to be looking for specifically what this offers and other things like the totality of sound signature or the totality of sound quality, sorry, have to be kind of lower on that list. Um, I think if you're just after it for the sound quality, there are far, far better options. Okay, so uh, I think that's gonna wrap it up for the LS50. Um, let's go ahead and talk about the Stelio really quick because I have the Stelio over here. Um, I decided not to do the Stelio review um, for one big reason. One, the Stelio that I have here sounds like absolute shit. Um, like it's bad in every capacity. Um, now, Focal is a company that I have known for having really good quality, like above anything else. They have they have really nice quality things um, like the Utopia, even though it's not for me, I can recognize that it's a fantastic headphone. The Alexa is a fantastic headphone, probably one of the best for the price range. The um, the clears were great uh, overall. As a brand, they have some really good quality. Now, I suspect that the Stelia is not... Uh, I suspect that my Stelia, the Stelia that I have here, is broken. And the reason why I suspect that is because um, there's a couple weird sound signature things. Like, the entire thing sounds like an echo chamber when you listen to it. And in fact, when you just put it on your head, you get kind of this... Um, the best thing I can equate it to is like a, it sounds like you're listening to a seashell. Like it's got that weird seashell effect where, uh, you know, I, I don't quite know how to explain it, but it, it sounds like there's like a, a chamber of, you know, like you strapped a mini cave onto your ear. You know how caves have that weird sound to them? You know, even when it's ambient quiet, it's still got that weird type of sound. And it kind of just sounds like that. So I think there's either a seal issue um, somewhere or just something, you know, I, I don't know quite what it is, but um, so it's got that when you just put it on. And then when you start playing it, it produces sound, um, but it just doesn't sound very good. It doesn't sound particularly clear. It doesn't sound particularly bassy. It doesn't sound uh, uh, particularly well-defined in any capacity. And it's so bad that, um, like normally, e even if I think I got a bad example of the headphone, um, like I think, I think the K712 way back in the day was a bad example because I actually heard a K712 recently and it was really amazing. Um, of course, I was on a different amplifier back then and stuff like that. But even if I have what I consider to be a bad review, review unit, I still review it. Um, because it's like, I, I never know. I never know if I have a fantastic example, a mid range example or a bad example. And, uh, but this one, <clears throat> it's, it's just so bad that like, like it's either one of the worst headphones ever, like for the price, like it's, it's truly like not good or it's a bad unit, like a broken unit or something like that. And it was shipped from uh, another state and it, it's quite used, so it, it's it's possible. Um, and I didn't want to ignore the problem, and I didn't want to talk about it a little bit, but I didn't want to make a dedicated review talking about a headphone that I'm pretty sure is broken and just shitting all over. I didn't think that would be kind of the best way to go about. Now, the TH900 Mark II, I will be reviewing, and that is a headphone that I'll be reviewing for uh, uh, in a couple days here, and I will be shitting all over that. <laughs> 
it's not good. All right, we'll talk about the uh, Aorist R2R in a second, but I wanted to uh, talk about these Heifman TWS 600s. So uh, Heifman sent one pair of these over uh, a few months ago, like months and months ago, actually. And then they, I hit them up because they sounded bad. And I was like, yo, like, uh, I'm not sure if it was one of those situations, same as the Stelia, where I was like, okay, this sounds like particularly bad for the price. Cause I think these are like 200 or 250 or something like that. And, uh, they, uh, were like, okay, we'll, we'll send you a different unit and, uh, you can toss the other one, do whatever you want with the other one. This one showed up. Sounds the same. Um, do better, please. It, this is really bad. Like I would, I would actually rather listen to uh, like standard standard Apple ear like earphones. Um, this is not good at all. Um, it doesn't have any level of dynamics. It doesn't have any level of mid range. It doesn't have any level of of uh, bass response. It just sounds like upper mid range and treble, but it's not even refined, and it's not very clear. It's just uh, just an absolute mess, and it sounds uh, really really not good. And from a company like Heifman, who makes amazing products a lot of the time, uh, this is, uh, in my opinion, completely unacceptable. So I wanted to approach that. And uh, uh, thanks, Heifman, for sending it out, as, as always. Uh, but I do have to be honest when um, stuff like that does come up. Okay. Now, the Arist R2R DAC. And uh, I don't normally talk about DACs, which is why I'm not going to review it. Uh, but I did want to explain this one a little bit because I've been using it as a DAC. Um, and I kind of have some thoughts about uh, R2R as a whole, sort of, not really, not like any proclamations or anything like that. But so uh, Sennheiser, I'm um, sorry, <laughs> Drop sent this over a while ago. And uh, I've been using it in my front room as the front room DAC into my uh, speaker amplifier and then into the speakers. And I quite like this thing. Um, I was using the Gashelli Labs before and there's definitely a bit of a bump in terms of the RCA output um, that is pretty audible over that Gashelli Labs and uh, it's basically I, I guess the best way I can explain it is that there's there's clarity but a little bit more warmth than the Gashelli Labs like it's clearer but it's also slightly warmer than the Gashelli Labs and that for me is perfect. That's kind of exactly what uh, what I would want in a sound system over the Gashelli Labs. Like I'm always down for like something a little bit warmer and a little bit clearer if it can achieve both. Fantastic. Um, now I've heard from a couple people just in the uh, grapevine of things talk about how this is a particularly bad example of an R2R DAC, and that you have to spend like a thousand plus dollars on an R2R DAC to really uh, get any benefits and. Maybe that's true, but I'm not going to spend a uh, thousand bucks chasing the R2R Dragon, so to speak. Um, and uh, this has been a pretty solid unit. I haven't had any issues with it. It's got uh, Masterop's uh, standard build quality that you find on like their um, their uh, Kavali tube hybrid amps and their THX 789s. And uh, it's been completely solid up until this point. I leave it running all day, every day, except for when I unplugged it for this. Um, and uh, it's got a couple of different inputs, USB, coaxial, and uh, optical. And then it's got uh, only RCA out, unfortunately. I wish it was a balance out. I think a balanced DAC like this uh, would be perfect for the 789 stack, especially because it's exactly the same structure. But I think anybody who purchases the 789 was balanced in and balanced out. So uh, like for me, for example, I want that. Um, so it's almost perfect, but I think the price range is right. The build quality is amazing. I think the structure is, it's really clean, really minimalistic. Just got two buttons in the front, power, and then your switch for optical, um, USB, and coaxial. And uh, as far as this unit, I can't really ask for much more. I've really enjoyed my time with it. Um, some people hate R2R with a passion. <laughs> I don't see it. I don't, I don't think it's that bad, um, but uh, it's been it's been fun. Anyways, so I think that's going to wrap up this uh, episode. I'm sorry it's so long, uh, but it's going to be surprisingly, even though it's shorter, or even though it's going to be longer than most of my other videos, um, it's going to be way easier for me to deal with, especially with uh, no B-roll or anything. So I'm sorry you had to pay attention to my face so much. Um, but uh, 
really does save me a lot of time. I wanted to present some of my thoughts on these products here. Um, and I didn't want to ignore them. And I still wanted to give you guys the information uh, that I felt was uh, paramount for me to give. But I just don't have the time uh, for the reviews for these. Now, what I do have the time and what I prioritize right now is reviews for a lot of products that are coming out very, very shortly. In fact, one probably came out yesterday. So I've got the HDV820. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I do have that too. I got the HD820, the HD800S, the 800S versus the Aria, the 820 versus the Z1R. Um, I have a secret project that I can't quite announce yet, but it's coming up on the 26th of December. And speaking of uh, Christmas, if you celebrate Christmas, Merry Christmas. And it'll be coming in the day after Christmas. Um, gonna take Christmas off because, you know, Christmas is Christmas. So, uh, and then I have the HGV820 amp. I've got the iFi Pro amps and a, a couple of other headphones, CH900, that stuff coming out and should be a lot of fun. So definitely stay tuned. Please subscribe if you're not already. Uh, like the video if you like it. Comment down below. Uh, this probably feels a bit more natural than some of my other videos that are like really structured and heavily edited. Um, I prefer the structured edited feel like it just, I don't know, as an artistic endeavor, it feels a little bit more complete than this does. But uh, if this is something that you would like to see maybe once a week, these are very easy for me to do. So I would love to be able to, you know, kind of take a, a day off, so to speak, when uh, not, uh, you know, edit, but maybe like the uh, the the B-roll and all that stuff uh, more. And uh, if that's the case, then I'll just continue doing what I'm doing because I definitely really like the uh, creative uh, director, cinematographer type of feel that uh, I try to uh, kind of encapsulate in these reviews. So that's going to wrap it up, guys. Thanks for watching. My name is Josh, and I'll see you uh, on, does it come out Tuesday? I'll see you on Thursday. All right, guys.